Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Near Wellsburg in Brook County in West Virginia, this area was strip mined and reclaimed years later. There is a road that leads up to where there is field. Not sure what is there today. I'm not sure if the trail or path are still there, but I'm sure the high walls that go around it are. The second time we were on a path leading up into the woods, just at the crest of the hill is where we heard the noises. I grew up in the outskirts of the small town of Wellsburg in the northern part of West Virginia. In the northern panhandle, ever since I was little, we would ride our dirt bikes in the old strip mine that was called Center Hill. Well, years passed and that old mine was reclaimed. We would still ride over there even though we were not allowed. It was summer because we were out of school. Me and a friend went trail riding. There was a flat area and along the trail was a high wall, and on the other side was a drop-off and a road. We would ride that trail to the gas line and cut up over the gas line to the road and go home. Or we would turn around and go back through the trails. On the way through the trails, there was a pit. We called it the sulfur pit because it would turn your clothes orange. The color of the water was orange and deep on one side and shallow on the other side. It was like the rest of the trail butted up against the high wall. On the day I'm talking about, I was on my bike and my friend was on his four-wheeler. We went through the pit and were playing around it. We ended up getting the four-wheeler and my bike stuck. It took a long time to recover the machines. Later that day, we saw something walking on the top part of the high wall. It was not walking on the edge. It was walking like along the tree line. We stopped and watched this thing walk to a tree and crouch down. I don't think it knew we were there until we yelled out at it for help. The guy I was with said it was a friend of ours, but we were out there where no one would be walking, even during hunting season. I think he said that so I would not flip out. You don't just walk out that far, even during hunting season, because if you get something, there is only two ways to bring it out up over the high wall or down the high wall. We continued to yell out to this thing with no response back from it. We yelled out the name of the person that he thought it was several times. No answer. We even yelled out if it could come down and help us. We did not know what it was. So probably a good hour went by and we were still trying to get his four-wheeler unstuck. The next thing we know, this thing gets up and walks the same way it came from. It was big and had long arms down its side. It walked upright like a person. We watched this thing the whole time it was there, and it watched us working. We did not know what it was or what was going to happen. We did not know what it was going to do. After it was out of sight, we went back to getting his four-wheeler out. Finally, we got his four-wheeler unstuck, and my bike and got out of there. We had to ride the same direction it had walked. A couple of days later, we saw our friend that it was supposed to be over there, and he said it wasn't me. After that, nothing else was said about it. We rode and hunted over there a few more times. I stopped riding there when I started racing. A couple years later, when I was a freshman in high school, I took my girlfriend at the time over there. We were just walking and a hill that you had to go up to get to the path that went up into the woods. We got to the top of this hill and heard the brush move, then a grunt noise, and then a growl. I turned to her and told her to walk down the hill, then run. We left there as quickly as we could. At one point, I remember being at my friend's house, the same one that got his four-wheeler stuck, and we were talking with his mom. She said to me, you know, there's a Bigfoot over in the strip mine? I said, no, really? She said that her son saw the footprints. I hunted in that area a few times, rode dirt bikes over there, and always felt like I was being watched. I've never told anyone. 
Just in the past year, I told my girlfriend of eight years. This is the first time I have come and told anyone my story of what I saw that day and the other time I was over there. I also noticed what my friend's mom said that day to me. I still see it in my mind. I never told anyone about what happened that day. Him, I'm not sure of, but it was strange how she came out and said it to me. The first sighting, me and a male friend, the second sighting, me and a girlfriend. It happened in the afternoon when we were riding. It was daylight out. The other time happened in the evening, a couple of hours before dark. On to the next one. This was near Baxter in Piscataquis County in Maine. I am a PhD environmental physiologist working for Natick Labs in Massachusetts. I was hunting on the east side of the lake, Long Pond in Baxter State with Danny Wolf, a vet now in Ohio, a friend from Montana, deceased, and another vet. One morning, I hunted alone south of the lake when I encountered a strange, musty smell in the woods, along with a foot-long black scat that looked human, except for the extraordinary thickness and width. I also observed small scat that looked like a large pile of baby feces with white and yellow texture. As I proceeded on, I was confronted with the sound of thumping like a partridge on steroids drumming. The ground actually shook. The hair on my neck was raised, and the pit of my stomach seemed suddenly queasy as the rotten smell got worse. Suddenly, a large, dead tree came crashing down about a hundred yards in front of me. This scared the crap out of me. As the woods were deathly quiet, no wind, no birds, I returned to camp and was severely goffed by two vets, Dr. Heischel and Dr. Wolf. Wolf, however, agreed to accompany me the next day. We went further into the swampy wood, saw yesterday's scat, and Danny said whatever it was, it was certainly big to push that dead tree down. We continued until the area became quite rocky with boulders larger than our heads on all sides. Danny said, this doesn't look like a good place to be because something could jump us before we could react. Suddenly, we encountered the drumming and the ground shaking again. This was followed by a huge rock which flew over our head and impacted on a hill to our left. Needless to say, we were both speechless and Danny said, whatever could throw a 50-pound rock 50 yards was not something he would care to encounter. Even though Danny had a 7 millimeter mag and I had a 270, we both agreed to leave. It was quite evident that whatever we had pissed off was clearly warning us not to go further. We returned to camp and my two friends became believers. The hunt was a failure because there were no signs of deer or even moose in the area. We had enjoyed retelling the story to our kids and friends over the years because none had ever experienced anything like that in years of hunting. It was the scariest thing I have ever encountered in my hunting career. I have shot elk in Colorado, and this year my wife and I shot over 50 pheasants and five deer. I'm on the board of advisors at the Uxbridge Rod and Gun Club, and as the Army's former expert on desert survival and heat stroke physiology, editorial board of wilderness and environmental medicine, I wrote the survival manual for Desert Storm and Desert Shield. I have published over 200 scientific papers, abstracts, and book chapters, but this is the first time I have written about this strange encounter. I'm 65 and have retired from Army Environmental Medicine as a lab director. I also noticed the smell, the human-like monster scat, the baby scat, and the drumming, ground-shaking, tree-felling, and boulder-throwing. 
It was early morning, overcast and cloudy, with cold, misty rain and no sun or wind. The area is woods, but swampy, leading to rocky heights. On to the next one. In Cumberland County in Maine, Miss Huntington reported that her daughters have seen the animal three or four times. The first sighting consisted of four youngsters on bicycles seeing it. The three Huntington children, Louise, 13, George, Jr., 10, Scott, 8, and their friend Tammy, 12, were riding along the road about half a mile from the Huntington home. They matter-of-factly reported an encounter with a chimp. Miss Huntington would later tell reporters, My 13-year-old daughter fell off her bike about three feet from him, and all he did was cock his head and look at her. It was described as upright and chimpanzee-like. The quiet, intelligent, reserved Lois reportedly told Maine Sunday Telegram, I fell down right in front of him, and all he did was look at me. I would have known if it were a hippie or something, but it had a regular monkey face. You've seen a monkey before, haven't you? A gorilla-like animal standing on its hind legs was observed two or three times by James Washburn. Officers searching the area found moose and deer tracks. As a note, finding moose tracks anywhere in Maine is not unusual. Miss George Huntington of Lisbon Fall Road, Durham, was driving home from a baseball game when she saw an ape peeking out from the bushes on the Durham Road. It was 25 feet away and made a mad dash on two legs into the heavily wooded area. The exact description of the ape was that it was a little over five feet tall with a shaggy black coat and weighing about 350 pounds. She said it had a monkey face. Chimp-like was another way it was described. She coasted her vehicle so as not to scare it, but when it apparently saw her vehicle, then it ran into the woods. She reportedly saw it two separate times during this incident as she returned with neighbors and sighted it again. She stayed in her car as others searched the woods. She was sitting in her car when she saw it again, peering at her from the crotch of a tree. Soon after, police were notified, arrived, and began a search. Andros Noggin Sheriff Department, a number of deputies, Cumberland County Sheriff's Department, the Maine State Police, and the State of Maine Game Warden, all together, over 30 officers in 30 police cars searched for the animal for two hours. A helicopter was used in a search in the following days. Tracks found near a cemetery and was not directly associated with the sighting looked human, but it had claws. They appeared to be that of a bear. At first, that night, some officers brushed off the whole incident as a bear sighting. This would change. Huntington commented, They make it out to a monster. I never said it was a monster. Several more witnesses had come forth saying they had seen it. At 7.30 p.m., Peter and Jean Merrill had found footprints behind the Jones Cemetery, the scene of most of the sightings. They said it looked like a chimpanzee print. Andrew Snoggin, County Deputy Sheriff Blaine Footman, examined the series of prints and cast what was described as one was rather deep. Footman said it was about five inches wide with the thumb part broken off. Whatever made it weighs 300 or 350 pounds, and I can't tell you much more. It's definitely not a bear track. I don't know what's going on here, and I'd rather not express an opinion. After many more phone calls from others confirming they had seen an unusual animal in the area, police were taking the sightings very seriously. On to the next one. 
Tony and I were taking the trail from what is now Twin Lakes south to Copper Harbor. Four of us would usually go snowmobiling together, but the others had stuff to do at the last minute. The trail was perfect, very good condition. There must have been a foot to two feet packed the entire way. I was on a 1972 Bertanza 580 Brute 440cc sled. I could rock on that thing. Tony was on a 1967 Skidoo Olympic with a Rotax 494cc engine. That thing was fast, but it handled like a log. It was dangerous, especially when Tony was on it. But something was wrong with Tony. He was acting all crazy. He almost plowed a plow, grooming the area along the trail, on up, and he just kept going. I had to stop and smooth things over with the plow guy. I'm sure he didn't see you, I said. Tell him to watch it and slow down. Has he been drinking? The guy asked me. No way. I would not be riding with him if he had. I told the plow guy. Yeah, I smoothed things over with the snow smoother. When I caught up to Tony, we were maybe just north of Eagle River. It was starting to get dark, and he was pointing east to me. Then he turns and starts blasting down the woods. He's turning, twisting, just going full into it. I followed him. That was stupid. That was my mistake. There was a lot of snow, and exploring was okay if you were going about it the right way. But this was not right. Something was wrong with Tony. I'm not sure what. Plus, I hated getting off the path. The paths were great. You could always have a smooth ride. Now we are crawling between snow-covered trees in the woods. It was all sluggish and lumpy. We must have been a couple of miles southeast of Copper Harbor, and a few fields were opening up. I did not know if there were lakes or what, but I could see Tony opening up his machine. I followed. It was dark now, and I was trying to get his attention to tell him I was going home. I had an electric horn installed that was loud enough, and I was using it. Then I was flashing him, but he just stepped on it. I guess he thought he was funny doing that. He hit a ridge of trees to the north and started crawling around them. I throttled it, opened it up across the field so I could catch up and tell him I was splitting. Just as I get to the ridge, he pushed down the hill and onto another plane, then he goes. I was just behind him, and when I hit the field, I took off after him. I thought, if I can catch him at the end of this field, I'll just go home. He'll figure it out. So, he's racing across the field. I'm racing towards him. Then, I see something running towards him from the woods across the field, going to cut him off. I thought it was a pair of riders with their lights off. I was watching them head straight for him. I was trying to warn him, but he was not paying attention. Then, just as he hit the tree line, there was a loud crash. His lights rolled over and shined back through large snow clouds billowing up. I was hoping it would not be too bad. When I got there, Tony was lying at the base of a tree. He was already dead. Steam was rising up from all the blood on the ground, and he was mangled. I had to leave to get help. I found a guy in a house, but it was a ways away. I called the county. County called for an airlift, but when the sheriff got there, he called it off. They could see it was of no use. Tony's arms were both gone. They were lying on the other side of the tree, still in perfect condition, like they had been pulled off. And his head had been smashed up so bad, at least half of it was gone smeared on the giant oak in front of him, and the machine was partially buried in the tree he rammed. I did not realize that Tony had been drinking. I really did not. But it was true. You could smell the alcohol at the accident, and he had a bottle of Jack in his snowsuit. The cops breathalyzed me. I was clean. After that, I was talking to a couple of deputies, and I asked, will they reconstruct this? because I don't understand how his arms ended up over there like they were pulled off. Then, 
one of the deputies, who was a know-it-all a-hole, there's always one, isn't there, started telling me, when the tracks are still moving and you get jarred, all kind of things can happen. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. But the other deputy, the adult, told me, yeah, we will have a reconstructionist we have used before get up and take a look before we have additional snow cover. Good, I said, because it just didn't look right to me. You said you saw other riders, the deputy asked me. Yeah, well, I thought it was other riders. I could not really see because of the angle in the dark and the mist on the snow. It looked like riders, I blurted. Well, if there were riders, we'd have tracks, but all we got is animal tracks, the deputy said, and shined his flashlight down on the ground. A big dog, by the looks of it, just one. He rolled his tongue around in his mouth for a minute and told me, I think he might have hit a dog or swerved to miss a dog. I looked down at the track. Are you sure that's a dog? Those are huge prints, I told him. I don't know. We'll look into it, he told me. Then the know-it-all wanders back up. Yeah, we'll look into it. Just let us handle this. He probably swerved and intersected the tree and the machine came back down on top of him, severing his limbs, he told us. I just stood there looking at him. Then he added, Yep, I've seen worse, and walked away with authority. What an idiot. Well, I have not seen worse, and I've been doing this for over 30 years, the other cop tells me. Anyways, we'll let you know what we find out. They took a lot of pictures. Tony was taken away. His sister was distraught. I really don't think she ever recovered. About a month or so later, the good cop called me and asked a few more questions. He seemed more puzzled than anything else. We picked those tracks up in the East Woods. Then they were running, you know, you know, long, skid-deep punches. But it looked like it was moving on two feet, which is strange, he told me. Then we lost the track to the north part of the woods, where he was either joined by another dog or was walking on all fours. He stopped. Weird, I told him. Yeah, it's just that I can't find any a DNR who will say definitively that it's a dog print. I mean, the running skids are one thing, but the only thing anybody will tell me about the ones where it appears to be walking around the accident site is that it is about four to six times too big to be a canine, even though they are classic canine prints. He paused, then told me. The best explanation I can get was that maybe it was a small print that melted, then refroze, so it looked bigger. But, like I told him, they were fresh prints. Weird, I told him. You got that right, he answered. Well, that was it. It was considered a snowmobile accident, one fatality. Michigan has a lot of them, and most of them are because people are drinking and strike trees, logs, etc., or roll the vehicles. Tony did all three, case closed. I am not really sure of what I saw, but I know I saw something overtake him, and he must have been doing more than 50 miles per hour but all they found were animal tracks. I wonder if maybe it had been a trick of the light that made it look like something moving and maybe the tracks were just a coincidence. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized it was too much of a coincidence. About a year later, I was trying to get info on the crash and could not find anything. I called the deputy. He was already working in the lower peninsula near Grand Rapids. He told me he would get back to me. Then he puts me in touch with someone who worked for the coroner. She said they never listed it as a snowmobile fatality because it was undetermined. If he had been riding at the time of his death, I shouted profanities into the phone. Then, after telling me to watch my language and so forth, I was sent around in a circle of calls that led me back to somebody listing the case of death to be from impact injuries and blood law, and all this stuff. I thought that was weird. When I got back in touch with the deputy, he told me that because they were investigating the thing for a while, that the coroner probably needed to use open-ended language. I had no idea what that meant. 
but I did get a really creepy vibe that it was more than just a clerical error. I really felt like there was something there people were trying to hide. The same something that ran across that field and attacked Tony. I'm not trying to make Tony a martyr. I guess if he was drinking, it's just as good that he did not hurt anybody else. But something strange happened that night, and afterward, it just got stranger. On to the next one. In Walderboro in Lincoln County, Maine, on the 2nd of January, 1855, Mr. J.W. McHenry was chopping wood when he heard loud screams coming from a wooded area. He captured an 18-inch tall, hairy, man-like creature. The limbs were in perfect proportion. With the exception of the face, hands, and feet, it was covered in jet black hair. Was this a baby Bigfoot? Mr. McHenry had chased and captured the miniature human being near the town. The local Indians called the creature the Pamula. In 1946, in Bigelow Mountain, in Franklin and Somerset Counties in Maine, four dowsers were startled when they stopped along a trail to eat lunch and instead saw an enormous man walking towards them in the distance that was well over ten feet tall. He had long hair on his head and was covered in short black hair over the rest of the body. He carried what looked like a big rock. They left the area immediately. On to the next one. It was spring break during 10th grade for the boys. Here in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, spring wasn't always particularly warm as April commenced, but for Chip, Eric, Jason, and Henry, it was time to have some fun regardless of the temperature. All four boys liked baseball and had played countless games of pickup ball, including base dealing, fun goes, competitive fly ball catching, and strikeout or wall ball during their years in the neighborhood together. However, none of them was proficient enough to have made the high school baseball team this year or any year. The friendship, the snarky teen boy banter, and the chance to hang out together unsupervised in the deep green outdoors of the Northwest was the real draw in terms of their continuing baseball interest. On this Monday, the first weekday of their school spring break, they'd have virtually the entire day to themselves as all parents were at work. The parents didn't have the luxury of a seasonal break. Ruddy-haired Chip took the initiative to call the other boys over the weekend and get at least some half-hearted commitments to joining up for baseball on Monday. Jason was the least motivated of the group on this score. Aw, oh, man. I'd rather sleep on Monday, he said to Chip on the phone. Every other stinking day, we have to get up before dawn and catch that stupid bus. This Monday, I just want to blob, he argued to Chip, with a resentfully sluggish attitude. With some hesitation, Chip replied, Dude, all right, just make sure you meet us by 11 or so. Even though most of the boys were meeting at 10 a.m., it was better for Jason to be a bit late than to not appear at all, Chip surmised. So, around 10.15, having ridden by bicycle from their suburban homes, three boys arrived at Hedgerton High School. The large school had a huge complex of sports fields, including baseball, football, soccer, softball, and track facilities. The school buildings themselves sat rather high up on a bluff, and every student or community member heading to the sports field had to descend rather precipitously in order to access them. The practice baseball and softball field were the furthest away from the main school building, well down the hill and extending perhaps 1,000 feet to a tree line in the west. Large, green, 80-foot-tall conifer and leafy hardwood trees form the boundary at the edge of the most distant field. Leaving the expanse, 
though empty, paved parking lot and their bikes behind, the three boys began to walk, carrying their jangling bats, gloves, and baseball bags down the steep rolling hills toward the field at the far corner of the sports complex. Geez, do you think they could have put that good field any further away, asked Eric. The downhill part isn't so bad, but coming back up sucks for sure, said Henry. Maybe they should have put a ski lift something out here, he added, with some creative flair. I'm just glad there's nobody around, said Chip, as the rambling baseball boys reached the flat bottom of the land and got closer to the limits of the outfield of their targeted turf. There's probably lots of lazy bums in bed like Jason today, he said. The field to which they were walking was wide open, with a full-sized backstop behind home plate, right up against the wall of big green trees bordering the school property. While the first base line paralleled the tree line, the left field line was directed straight toward the high school far atop the grassy hill. Foul balls behind home plate or down the right field line could end up as food for woodland beasts, while fouls toward left field could easily be corralled by fielders in the open space. Upon reaching the field, each boy dropped his payload and prepped for some baseball warm-up. Who's up first? asked Henry. That would be me, replied Chip. Every other time we're here, Jason hogs the leadoff spot and I have to chase butterflies in left until he's done whiffing. The boys began with a triangular session of warm-up catch. It was a good way to get the arms limber and perhaps try out a few wacky trick pitches like knuckleballs and screwballs with backward spin. One such knuckleball from Eric went over Henry's head and rolled to the backstop behind home. Good one, do, said Henry, with very little restraint as he turned and jogged toward the backstop to retrieve the ball. Considering the not overly high throw, Eric replied, you could have caught it if you weren't busy scratching your part. Waiting for Henry's return with the ball, Eric thought he'd heard a branch break somewhere far out in the woods. He didn't think much of it. The civilized world seemed to largely end right at the edge of these steep woods. None of the boys had ever really considered how far the wood might extend to the next property limit or landmark somewhere in the deep forested distance. Okay, let's do it, said Chip, anxious to get started swinging away with the lumber under the bright morning sun. The lumber was actually an aluminum bat that, like all such weapons, made a resounding ping upon making contact with a baseball. Chip grabbed a bat and stepped up to the plate. Eric took the mound and Henry ambled toward left field to await the morning's action. With a bag of baseballs next to the mound, Eric began his flunky fuselage of wild fastballs, errant knuckleballs, and kooky curveballs. After four or five pitches missed the center of the plate by a long shot, Chip leaned back on his heels and rested the bat on his shoulder. You know, he began, if you pitch to me instead of Canada, we might get somewhere today. I'm not warm yet, replied Eric. I'll have pinpoint control soon. Yeah, and I'll have a full beard by then, said Chip. Of the first ten or so pitches that Eric threw to Chip, the big boy swung just one. At a low curveball, which soon bounced to the empty backstop like all the other balls. Well, that was pretty pathetic, summarized Chip. Eric walked toward home plate and the backstop to retrieve all the baseballs in his glove, then returned to the mound for round two of batting practice. Soon, Eric and Chip got into a better BP groove. Chip caught one high knuckleball with his bat and shot a powerful line drive out in the direction of Henry in left center field. Thanks, ladies, yelled Henry as he took off after the bounding line drive. Chip managed to square up several balls during his third round of pitches, sending several of them high and far over Henry's head. The balls rolled unimpeded through the short grass toward the distant hills below the school building. Chip was pleased that Eric was able to throw at least a few strikes that could be reached without a huge fishing net. 
Chip wasn't much for joining organized sports teams, but he was quite strong and could power the stitched apple quite a long distance off the bat. After three rounds of Eric's colorful tosses, it was time to round up all the balls and transition to the next batter. Now, it was Henry's turn. Eric stayed on the mound, somewhat to Henry's chagrin. As Henry walked in from the outfield and rolled a few of the retrieved baseballs to Eric while passing the mound on the way to the plate, he made a suggestion. How about throwing me some strikes this time instead of killing all those bugs in the grass, he said to Eric. You look pretty buggy to me, replied Eric, and I might squash you just like I did those other critters. Strikes, man, strikes. Henry asserted forcefully. After a few ludicrously wild knuckles, Eric was able to better groove most pitches as he eventually had done with Chip. Henry wasn't much of a hitter, though, and didn't do much more than shoot a couple of squibs through the infield and barely into the outfield grass. He finally hit a fly ball to the left that Chip glided in and under, catching it easily like the proverbial can of corn. Nice, dude complimented Chip to Henry. Geez, I think I could throw my glove further than that, admitted Henry. After Henry's three adventurous rounds of Eric's pitching, it was time for Eric himself to bat. The official switcheroo was on. Eric headed up to retrieve the balls around the mound and headed for the plate. Henry grabbed his glove and ambled out again to left field, and Chip moved in to take over pitching duties. Eric kept his glove on so he could warm up Chip. He wanted Chip in a good groove so he'd get reachable pitches. After seven or eight warm-up throws, Eric tossed his glove, grabbed his favorite bat, and stepped in. Chip threw the first pitch, nice, straight, and wild. It went about two feet over Eric's head and hit the backstop on the fly with a loud ching as the ball struck the chain link. Uh, you know, it's just me, sir, not Sir Sasquatch, he complained to Chip. Yeah, yeah, grumbled Chip. He slowed the rest of the pitches down and got most of them closer to the area of the plate. Eric missed a few good pitches, lined a few over the infield, and hit one long one out toward Henry. As the first BP round was nearing its close, he looked a very inside fastball from Chip. The ball popped straight up off the bat, and went well backwards over the backstop and into the trees. Pitcher and batter stood and admired the pop-up somewhat as it disappeared into the green and made a leaf-crunching touchdown somewhere. On the last pitch of the ground, Chip threw a nasty curveball which nearly bent Eric in half as he lunged at the fast-disappearing outside pitch. He essentially tossed the bat at the ball and nearly fell down on his knees. Okay, that's it for this one, said Chip with a muffled giggle. I want a review from the booth, said Eric, essentially protesting the unhittable nature of Chip's final, fairly devastating curveball. The boys followed a well-honed rule in the BP field. He who hits it, gifts it. This meant that if a foul ball went careening into the unmanned distance or back behind home plate, the batter who authored the errant hit was responsible for rounding up and returning the ball at the end of his session. It also meant that if the boys were playing at the nearby elementary school and one of them hit a homer onto the roof, that batter got roof climbing duties. So Eric dropped his bat and headed around the backstop into the wood in search of the foul ball. At least no one got hurt that round, yelled Henry to no one in particular. Now, hey, it wasn't too bad, said Chip evenly. Eric trudged through the trees and weeds in the general direction of where the fowl had flown. This was never a quick component of the boys' batting practice. They often lost balls in the foliage, and this was never a desirable outcome since no one had any money to spend on new baseballs. Eric moved further back into the trees, eyes rapidly scanning the ground in search of the only round white object in the brush. At this distance back, it must have been a fairly forceful foul. He kicked through leaves and low plants and moved broken, rotted branches aside looking for the ball. This could take some time. With all the other balls having been retrieved, 
Chip took a seat on the pitching rubber and aimlessly fiddled the leather stringing of his glove. Henry chose to lie down and watch a few high, thin clouds roll past on this mostly sunny, quiet morning. Eric finally spotted the ball about ten feet away in front of the very wide trunk of a big oak tree. As he started to jog with enthusiasm toward the ball, he thought he saw a large, dark head stick out from behind the tree that was maybe sixty or seventy feet behind the tree where the ball rested. The dark, hair-covered shape higher than the height of a grown man quickly disappeared back behind the tree and was no longer visible. Eric kept walking and picked up the baseball, still looking in the direction of the unusual figure. Then he stood still and quiet, listening for several moments before turning and quickly jogging nervously back toward the ball field. I thought you were actually headed for Canada, Chip theorized. Nah, said Eric, but this ball was way back there, and I saw some weird person or a thing a little ways off. He threw the ball to Chip on the mound. A person or thing, asked Chip. I think either a person or thing would be way too bored to hang out back there waiting around. Eric wasn't buying the dismissive tone. No, man, I saw something, he said. Hey, what's going on, yelled Henry, loudly and impatiently from left field. Quit your jawing. He says he saw Chewbacca or something, explained Chip in a loudly sarcastic voice to Henry. Henry thought about this for a moment and added, Oh, yeah, right. Can we get back to it now? At the insensitive groating, Eric let out something between a sigh and a growl at the others. Are you too traumatized to bat, or would you like to man up a bit? Asked Chip to the clearly annoyed Eric. Okay, bring him on, instructed Eric, as he roughly grabbed his bat and got back into the box to hit. Chip resumed pitching, and the next round of balls and swings proceeded without further incident. The lack of subsequent foul balls going behind the backstop was facilitated by Eric's newly deliberate strategy of hitting the top of the pitched baseball so that pop-ups were less likely to ensue. Every pitch that he struck during his last round of swings became a ground ball through the infield or a liner just over it. Soon, walking out toward left field, glove on hand, Eric passed by Henry, who was coming in to pitch to Chip this time. Chupacabra, asked Henry mockingly. Eric raised his glove and very nearly swung it to give Henry a good pop on the side of the head. It was way bigger, explained Eric, with a mounting frustration. It was a person or some weird tall thing. Well, do you think you can throw strikes? Asked Henry with a high measure of derision. With this final insult, Eric wound up and threw his glove as hard as he could at Henry's lower body. Henry bent and tried to elude the launched leather, but it caught him square on the left fanny cheek. Okay, okay, Henry acquiesced. So, you can throw a glove better than a ball. Recovering quickly, Henry jogged the rest of the way to the mound, and Eric retrieved his tossed glove before heading out to left field. As he took his spot in the field and turned in toward home plate, he couldn't help but look over just a bit to the right of the batter where his foul ball had pierced the green screen of the tree leaves and disappeared several minutes before. There was nothing unusual to see now. Finally, stopping to assume an athletic fielding position midway out in the left field, Eric realized how truly unnerved he was about seeing the dark figure in the woods. And now he was quite sure the other boys would continue with their inelegant expressions of disbelief over his report. As Chip began bashing balls that chased Eric soundlessly around the yard, Eric noticed that Jason had finally made it to the field to join them. Well, well, began Chip with marked disdain. Sleeping Booty has joined the land of the living. After a moment of hesitation, he yelled to Chip, at least the extra sleep keeps me from looking like a catcher's mitt, unlike some others here. Eric stifled another groaning growl. The rounds of BP continued without any unusual development. Jason took his first turn and stroked no more than a few lazy fly balls to the outfielders. Perhaps he'd be more awake by 2 or 3 p.m. After a few more uninspired swings and less than lengthy hits, 
The round was over, and it was time for Eric to retrieve his straight-back foul ball. He decided this time to take his aluminum bat along just to boost his nerve somewhat as he ventured into the dark trees. He walked toward where he figured the ball would most likely be, whereas his first foul had veered off to the left somewhat, this second foul seemed to go straight back but deeper into the wood. Eric began scanning the brush in search of the ball. He thought he saw it at one point, but what he saw turned out to be only a ball-sized rock. He continued looking down for the ball while intermittently looking up to see if the mysterious creature shape was still anywhere nearby. It didn't seem to be. At one point, Eric used his bat to knock through a low tangle of weeds midway between two large trees. He thoroughly poked through the weeds for the baseball to no avail. As he raised his head from the search, the face he had seen previously emerged from behind a wide tree only about 50 feet away. Eric instantly froze. The large, dark face was completely still and tilted sideways as it peered around the tree toward Eric at about eight or nine feet in height. Both human and creature face were absolutely still for several seconds. Then the game changed. The creature silently stepped out from behind the tree and reality instantly turned upside down for Eric. The creature had a man-shaped body but was gigantic in structure and covered head to foot in dark brown hair. Eric immediately knew what he was looking at, a Bigfoot. There was no mistaking this creature. The huge individual stood still for a moment, giving Eric an opportunity through a full fog of dread for a face-to-face -face size up of a giant, one mythical monster. The Bigfoot had incredibly broad shoulders and a wide face with a fairly flat nose. Ears weren't visible. The face didn't have much hair covering it as it did the rest of the body. It had piercing eyes and a serious, almost human expression as it assessed the small, pale human in front of it. The muscles on the creature, massive thighs, and long, powerful arms that stretched down around its knees, defied all sense of human scale. That, combined with the upright height of the Bigfoot, which was easily eight feet, was staggering. Eric was utterly and completely terrified, particularly now that the creature had begun striding toward him. If Eric had any remaining oxygen at that moment, he would have screamed at the top of his lungs, but the physical shock was too overwhelming. The creature seemed to be carrying something in one huge backward-turned hand, but Eric did not stick around to figure out what. He turned and ran through the brush back toward the field at top speed. It was without question the scariest moment of his life. Eric burst out of the trees and onto the grass behind the backstop. The other boys froze in place as they saw the clearly panicked batter round the backstop and sprint in the direction of the outfield. What's up, dude? Asked Chip incredulously from the pitcher's mound as Eric ran past. He got his answer quickly. There's a Bigfoot back there, Eric cried as he bolted past the players one by one. I'm not kidding, he continued. The thing is massive and it's coming this way. This outburst stunned each of the boys, and once Eric was done vocalizing, the boys could hear something striding through the trees toward the backstop. One particularly loud tree limb break made the threat seem all too real. We gotta go now, screamed Eric to all the others. Grab your gear. Each boy turned and quizzically observed Eric as he passed by at high speed, they were trying to wrap their minds around the potential threat. But the branch breaking coupled with Eric's obvious terror proved at least some motivation. Each boy grabbed his bat and glove or whatever they were equipped with and began running in a loose pack toward the school high atop the hill opposite the forest. Jason, the sluggard of the group, brought up the rear as the boys ran up the rolling hills, huffing and puffing with every panic step. Are you sure you saw a Bigfoot? yelled Chip to Eric, who was now far out in front of the rest of the boys. Not breaking stride, Eric turned and screamed backward. It's the biggest darn thing I ever saw. Keep running. Slow down if you want to die, he added. This sped up the baseball boys a bit. 
traversing the thousand feet from the low field up the rolling hills to the high school, each boy got pretty winded. They all wheezed and sputtered with increasing intensity as they ran uphill, turning back occasionally to see if any terrifying monsters had emerged from the woods. There was nothing, at least yet. The boys were heading to the right of the school building and the parking lot ringed by trees. Their four bikes awaited. When Eric had nearly reached the parking lot, he turned around to assess the situation. Still running, the other boys then saw him extend his arm outward, silently pointing back down over their head toward the field. Everyone stopped running amid full huff and puff and looked backward. At that moment, a group of boys saw a sight that none would ever forget. There, near the area of home plate, stood a huge dark figure, seemingly more than half as tall as the big chain link frame backstop. It was incredible. All senses were spinning as the boys stopped in place, still breathing very hard, trying to understand what they were seeing. Henry was bent over with hands on knees, trying desperately to catch his breath as he squinted in amazement at the huge figure far down below. Chip went down on his knees and dropped his glove as he realized what he was seeing. Without saying a word, all the boys began scrunching in closer together as if the physical closeness might provide some buffer against their shock and terror. I told you I saw someone back there, Eric said rather blankly. What in the world, said Chip. It's really him, said Henry, with a near smile, amazed that the Northwest primal legend was standing in the field where the boys had been two minutes ago. There was no motion now among the astounded young men, all staring at the gigantic creature, which was in turn looking far up the hill at them. Now fully revealed, the creature surprised all the boys by slowly rocking backward with one arm behind its body, its face seemed to remain focused on the boys. It almost looked as though the creature was throwing something into the air, as an outfielder would when making a very long toss toward home plate, trying to cut down a runner attempting to score. However, even though it looked like the creature had thrown something, whatever it was quickly disappeared into the bright daytime sky. What the freaking heck, added Chip, with no attempt at subtlety. The creature then stood back up to its full height and looked straight toward the boys again. Time seemed to stop as all the boys were trying to figure out what was happening. After nine or ten seconds, Eric tilted his head back and seemed to spot something in the sky. It was hurtling toward them from a great height. It was small and round. Finally, all the boys saw the incoming object. It was clearly a baseball, probably the off-white ball that Eric had fouled back into the wood. The Bigfoot had thrown it. Everyone froze as the ball began to drop from the light blue sky. Eric took only one step to the right as he saw the ball coming down. He was still holding his bat, which he promptly dropped upon seeing the ball approaching. The ball came straight toward the boys and Eric reached up in front of his face and caught the ball on the fly with bare hand. What? blurted Henry with profound confusion as the baseball nestled into Eric's hand with a light smacking sound. Each boy stared in total amazement at Eric, who stood still with a stunned expression and a baseball returned. The Bigfoot had thrown the ball all the way up to the level of the school parking lot, easily around a thousand feet in distance. It was a throw certainly unlike any creature had made in history, and it was completely accurate. I, I can't believe it, said Chip in a very gentle low voice. Jason simply warbled, dude, no way. The Bigfoot now stood completely still, with hands at its sides regarding the boys from afar. Chip thought he saw the creature bounce just a little, as Eric made the barehanded catch of a lifetime. Man, I guess it just wanted to give the ball back, said Eric quietly. He's one heck of a player, added Jason. A wave of amazement at what they had just witnessed overwhelmed each boy. They stood in stunned silence 
as they regarded the originator of the most astounding physical act any one of them would ever see, a gargantuan baseball Bigfoot. The creature then turned and walked away from home plate toward the left edge of the backstop. As it was about to go around the corner, it turned to its right and took one last seemingly lonely look at the group of boys. Then it turned and rounded the backstop, heading back toward the trees and disappeared into the deep, dark green forest. Back up on the hill, four boys continued to stand in shocked silence as the creature vanished, perhaps never to be seen again by any of them. A brief moment of communion with another, heretofore unrecognized species had touched each individual and the event would take years to make its full impact. I'm really hungry, said Jason unceremoniously. All of the other boys turned and regarded him with astonishment. Are you even awake? asked Chip. Jason replied, I'm getting there. On to the next one. I'm from Jackson, Wyoming an area that's rich with some of the largest wildlife you'll find in the United States. So, it's no surprise that an intelligent species would take residence out there of all places. My mother was a biology teacher, and my father a physics teacher, so we'd regularly do things that involved the sciences. I believe it was 1981 when they gave me a kite. It was an Easter present, and it was comprised of baby blue and light pink. That caused me to throw a tantrum because I was worried about the other kids seeing me playing with something pink. There was a scenic park close to our house that I would often walk to with my parents. My mother and father would often comment about how surprisingly green the location was. If you've ever been to Wyoming, you probably know that means parts of it look very dry, especially around the summertime. There was a lush field with hills where I would routinely fly my kite. Sometimes we would even see deer and moose grazing in the grass not too far off from us. This one day, a limping moose walked up onto one of the nearby hills, seemingly analyzing me, my father, and the kite, and then started grazing after realizing that we likely didn't pose any threat. We turned our attention back to the kite, before we soon heard a brief but awful squeal. By the time we turned our attention back toward the moose, there was no question that it was already dead. But that wasn't the most disturbing part of it all. Who was this disheveled man on top of this mammal, pressing his mangy face into its torso? Whoever they were, they seemed to pay no attention to us. However, the sun's position was casting a shadow that made it very difficult to make out any detail. All we could tell was that there was a very burly, strong-looking man with long hair atop the moose about a hundred yards off. It wasn't long after this wild man tore into the moose's flesh that its eyes locked onto the kite in the sky. Although I was young, I can remember my father being so very speechless. Very understandably, he was even more confused than I. Every few seconds or so, the wild man would dip his hands into the flesh of the moose and pull out the meat before quickly returning its gaze to the kite. When I look back at this situation, I think it's sort of poetic the way the wild man seemed so intrigued by the wind-supported object. Meanwhile, we were intrigued by the wild man himself. I'm not sure how long that routine continued, but I was mature enough to know we had found ourselves in a rare situation. With every second that passed, it became apparent that this was no man. It was something else, something that so few people ever encounter. I find it most interesting that my father didn't even have to explain that to me. I don't know if I should go as far as to say there was something almost magical about it, but I can't think of any other way to put it. Unfortunately, it wasn't much longer before that magical moment morphed into one of unparalleled horror. I don't know what my father nor I did to provoke such hostility, but the wild creature 
suddenly came charging down the hill, seemingly gunning straight toward us. How this thing ran is another thing I have so much trouble emphasizing. It was sort of like a leaping motion, but its heels pushed off the ground in a way that doesn't make much sense when I ponder it. At least, that's how it plays out in my memory. And I even recall my father commenting on the bizarre motion at a later time. Even though we knew by this point that this was no man, its bipedal charge eliminated any chance that it was any well-documented animal. Shortly after we turned and started running in the other direction, my father forced me to let go of the kite because it slowed my stride. Thank God he did that because the wild and then barking creature halted near the kite. We were still running, but that was when I could see that this thing was covered in hair, making it look somewhat like a half-man, half-bear with a thick mane surrounding its head. It was strange that the creature stopped wailing and chasing us as soon as we let go of the kite. What seemed like a belligerent killing machine suddenly morphed into this curious, almost housecat-like, gentle-looking thing. It's difficult to imagine what might have come about if we hadn't had that colorful kite with us during this encounter. Something tells me that was the only thing preventing the creature from further pursuing us if it would have continued its chase. I don't think I'd be here to tell you the story. I apologize to all those folks out there who insist these creatures are harmless, but I think that just a silly idea. I don't see what could prevent one of these creatures from hunting a human if it were hungry enough. Sure, it's possible for them to be playful, but there's no question that survival is their priority. I can't help but find it very amusing that there exists TV shows where a group of often unathletic people hope to cross paths with these things. What do they suspect is going to happen if they succeed? I haven't seen too many of those types of shows, but I've never seen any indication that anyone is armed. Seriously, what would they do if these things got aggressive with them? Throw a rock at it? Bash it over the head with a boom microphone? What a joke. I'm sorry I get so cynical. I just can't believe anyone out there takes those TV shows seriously. In my opinion, it's the equivalent of a bunch of unarmed Boy Scouts walking around with a camcorder, hoping to encounter a grizzly. I remember my father being in a state of shock for quite a while following the incident. I even remember him having difficulty explaining any of it to my mother. She seemed like she was pretty worried about him based on how he was acting. Knowing my father's character, I'm sure he was doing everything he could to hold it together in front of me, but he was failing. I always wondered if it was the revelation that these creatures exist that freaked him out so hard, or if it was merely the fear of being charged by something so much larger than us. Maybe he was mainly panicked by the idea that he wouldn't have been able to do much had the creature decided to attack his child. I remember taking quite some time for his character to return to normal, and we rarely spent time outdoors after the incident no matter how hard my mother encouraged it. On to the next one. I want to start by saying that my family didn't perceive these things as animals. They saw them as spirits or ghosts, whatever you prefer to call them. My mom, dad, and sister, Gabriella, lived in central Texas. Being the elder sibling, I felt a natural responsibility not to allow myself to get worked up when the animals snooped around the yard, but the truth is that I was terribly afraid. If it wasn't for our parents insisting that the animals wouldn't harm us, I'm not sure whether I would have been able to hold it together. I was raised with an awareness that paranormal things are just one of many aspects of our world. I remember thinking it was weird the first time I heard a fellow grade schooler talk about how ghosts aren't real. That statement made no sense to me. On the other hand, I get why my parents thought the animals could be spirits. There were many occasions where they seemed to perform supernatural acts, and when you take into consideration 
how untraceable they are, I can empathize with the argument. Sometimes they would show up outside our bedroom windows and look in at us for a few moments before wandering off. Although their features were quite creepy, I can't say they ever looked at us in a way that suggested they wanted to hurt us. And again, our parents regularly told us that there was no reason to worry. But it wasn't until my later years that I started to ponder the truth regarding why all of our windows were reinforced by steel bars, even the ones encompassing the second floor. Gabriella once asked them why they do that, and our dad told them it was just for extra protection if we had tumultuous weather. That notion no longer checked out after realizing we never had any life-threatening storms while living in that location. My parents lived in that house for six years before I was born. That must have provided plenty of time to get acquainted with the animals. I've always wondered how frightening they must have been early on. I know they both had very little money around the time they moved in together, which would explain why they didn't feel it was wise to move anywhere else. It turns out they did a rent-to-own agreement with the previous owner, and they got a terrific deal on all of that. I can't help but wonder if the previous owner offered up that deal because of the creepy animals that roamed the territory. Another interesting aspect about these animals is that they seemed to only come out after sundown, which makes me think they must be a nocturnal species. If that is the case, it will shed more light on why people rarely see them or why quality images and video footage are scarce. They definitely have the ability to remain hidden. How many times have you seen a bobcat or a cougar in the wild? Now, imagine what an animal with far greater intelligence is capable of. One of the more frightening sightings that come to mind is when two Sasquatches got into an altercation. That was the first time that I ever thought they were trying to get into the house. But her family soon realized it was because one of them had shoved the other one into the house's outer wall multiple times over. The noise was so loud, making my heart nearly leap out of my chest. I couldn't have been any older than seven or eight when this happened, so you can probably understand how startling it was initially. It happened just outside our den, and it was such a weird visual to spectate their scuffle. It was like watching two large shadows fly all over the yard. Their agile motions so often seemed like they glided or hovered above the ground. I remember thinking they would hit each other so hard and it was astonishing that they could endure that many blows to the head. Just a single one of those punches seemed like it would have knocked even the most robust human's head right off their shoulders. There was always something about these animals' hair color that appeared darker than black, which is why I think of them as shadows. I suspect that's another reason this particular group to be part of a nocturnal species. Their hair color helps them blend in with the nighttime environment. I'm sure that variable must have played a role in why my parents had deemed them to be spirit. The altercation between the two animals probably lasted around a minute. While they fought, they both made these extremely high-pitched screeches, forcing the rest of my family and me to cover our ears while it commenced. I find it interesting how that was one of the only occasions where the animals made any noise. Usually, they were dead silent, making their appearance all the more surprising. Because of that, I don't doubt they loitered on our property on so many more occasions than we knew. I can't emphasize enough how stealth these animals are. I've also come across many reports where the Sasquatch's behavior doesn't match what I've experienced. Sometimes I even wonder if any of the ones other people have encountered might have contracted rabies. If humans and so many other mammals can get it, what's preventing Sasquatch from getting it? Perhaps it's happened when they're hunting prey that turned out to be rabbit. It's crazy to imagine a scenario where one member of a Sasquatch clan catches rabies. How would the others go about dealing with that? Would they know to kill the infected member before others could fall victim? There are now so many questions I have about these animals. Another one of the more incredible sightings was when one of the Sasquatches on our property 
was missing an enormous chunk of his hip region. What could have led to an injury of that magnitude? I'm not sure why, but we rarely powered on the outdoor light when the animals would come around. I'm guessing it's because my parents worried it might disturb them and provoke hostility. But this was one of several occasions where my dad just couldn't help himself. He was so curious to get a good look. The animals dashed out of sight as soon as he switched on the light. But we still had just enough time to see the severely damaged flesh along the outside of the upper leg. I would pay good money to learn what happened to that animal. I suppose there's a chance it could have been from a gunshot, but only a shotgun could have inflicted that large of an injury. But that wouldn't make much sense because the damage appeared to be fresh. Nobody in my family heard gunshots of any kind. Since this life is so much stranger than our society gives credit, I'll even go as far as to wonder if another cryptid could have taken a bite out of it. I've never seen one, so I can't verify whether they exist, but could a dogman have been responsible? Also, how was the Sasquatch still able to move so efficiently even with a nearly half of a leg missing? There's so much about the species that I fear we'll never understand. On to the next one. I once had a dream of hiking the entire length of the Pacific Crest Trail, all 2,663 miles from the Mexican border to the Canadian border. It's an unbelievable hike, and I'd done several stretches of it at the time the story took place. I was in my 40s and looking for a challenge that went beyond all the wild things I'd done in my youth, something I could look back at with pride. Maybe I was fighting off the thought of becoming middle-aged, I don't know. I'd come across a copy of a book by Eric Rayback, the 17-year-old who claimed to be the first to hike the trail as a through-hiker, which means he did it all without stopping or doing sections one at a time. Eric claimed to have set up intricate resupply packages and that he often went hungry. He was later accused of having taken car rides, so I don't know if his story is true, but it inspired me to want to do that hike. So there I was, visiting my sister who lived in Klamath Fall, Oregon, for a week in July. She has since moved, and I haven't been back to that country for years as I live in Phoenix. It was a nice summer day, my sis was at work, and I wanted to go check out a section of the Pacific Crest Trail that ran not too far from town. There were several places I could intersect it and hike it as far as I wanted to go. I had studied the map and set up my day pack the previous day, and I was all set to go. I decided on going to the Four Mile Lake area, which was about 35 miles northwest of Klamath Falls. On the highway, then another six miles on a dirt road that led to Four Mile Lake Campground. As I drove up that so-called dirt road, I realized it wasn't the kind of dirt I'm used to at all, but it was made of cinders. I was in volcano country. I could see the huge peak of Mount McLowan towering over everything ahead of me. The highest peak in southern Oregon. And it for sure looked like a volcano. I parked my old Nissan pickup there at the campground in the shade of a big lodgepole pine, then darted out on the trail. There was no one around, which surprised me as it was such a nice day even though it was midweek. I did see a small older Volkswagen rabbit parked nearby, but with nobody in or around it. Probably another hiker, I figured. It's a small and very pretty campground, so I'm sure it fills up on the weekend. Four Mile Lake is pretty darn big, especially for someone from Phoenix, where a lake is a rare sight. It sits right under Mount McLaughlin, which I would stake my life on being a cinder cone volcano, just like its neighbor down the road away, Mount Shasta. Even though it was July, the slopes of the mountain had snow partway down them. It was a very picturesque and beautiful place, 
the lake and that big mountain towering a good 4,000 feet above it. I started out on a trail called Sky Lake Wilderness Trail that wound through a dense fir forest filled to the gills with mosquitoes. I was ready for them, though, as I had my bug net, the same one I used around Phoenix to keep off the gnat. I had been warned by my sister, and I also wore long pants and a long-sleeved cotton shirt. They didn't bother me, but they sure tried. After about three miles of pretty easy hiking, I came to Squaw Lake, a smaller lake not far from Four Mile Lake. Several social trails took off to Squaw Lake from the main trail, probably created by fishermen. I wasn't in a hurry, so I decided to take one of them and go see what the lake looked like. I had been hiking for three miles and was ready for a break. I was soon at the lake shore and I found a nice rock to sit on where I drank some water and ate a granola bar. As I was sitting there, I noticed movement not too far down the lake shore from where I sat. There was someone else here and I figured it was whoever owned the Volkswagen Rabbit. They hadn't seen me, so I just sat there and watched them to see what they were doing as they were walking back and forth along the shoreline. They had something on their back that kind of looked like a pack, but not quite, and I wasn't close enough to make it out. As I sat there, this figure stopped walking back and forth and just stood there for a bit, then started walking out into the water. It seemed to me that the water would be a bit cold to be swimming, and it didn't look like they were wearing swimming gear, but rather were totally clothed. So I found this strange. What was even stranger was the fact they disappeared into the water, not swimming at all, but just walked into it and disappeared. This alarmed me, and I wondered if someone were trying to commit suicide or something. I stayed there for a long time, searching the waters with my eyes, trying to see if a body surfaced somewhere in the vicinity, but nothing came up. The figure just disappeared. I wasn't sure what to do. I hadn't seen a ranger or anyone, and by the time I got back to report it, the person would be beyond help. In fact, they were probably already drowned, I figured, as I'd been sitting there a good 15 minutes watching for them. Maybe they'd swam underwater and come up along the shore where I couldn't see them. I finally stood up and headed back to the trail, having decided to go ahead with my hike as I didn't know what else to do. I hiked on up until I started to get into what appeared to be a hemlock forest. Before too long, I was really climbing, and the hemlocks began to make way for gnarled pines and manzanita. I could see the flanks of Mount McLaughlin through the trees, and it looked to me like there was a crater on its flanks left by a lateral volcanic blast, but I had read it was really a thermal glacial moraine, a fact verified when the trail met the rubble field at its bottom. It was a beautiful place, but I was still thinking about the person who had walked into the lake and wondering if they were okay. It was then that I had a strange feeling that I was being followed. I turned and scoped out the trail, but I didn't see anyone. I continued on, but my senses were on high alert, and for no particular reason, as I hadn't heard or seen anything. It was hard to explain to myself, as I'm a pretty pragmatic person, but I somehow knew I wasn't alone up there. Not long after, I started getting that feeling. I heard something in the thick shrubs alongside the trail, back in maybe 30 or 40 feet, not really close. I stopped and strained to see into the shadows, but saw nothing, and the noise had stopped. It was like someone was walking alongside the trail and stepping on branches and breaking them. The noise started up when I did, and when I would stop, it stopped. I started getting an uncomfortable feeling of terror, something I've never felt before, and I've been out with coyotes and bears and even charged by javelinas. On top of all this, I was getting tired, and I wasn't in top shape, so I decided to go back. I wanted to run, but I knew if it was a predator, that was a bad idea, so I just hiked back down at a really fast pace. Whatever it was, it had turned with me, 
and was still paralleling the trail. As I got back down a ways, I noticed some big branches had been broken off nearby trees and laid across the trail. It had to have been done very recently, as I knew they weren't there when I came up. Now, as I got further back down, this thing started making a noise that I can only describe as being bird-like in that it was like a bird call, although not quite. It was high and shrill and like a hoot, but more drawn out. This wasn't anything I'd ever heard, and I couldn't figure out how a bear could make a sound like that. Now, I was worried I was being followed by someone who maybe wanted to rob me or something, as it sounded like a person walking alongside me, someone big enough to be able to crash through thick underbrush. All I had for protection was a pocket leatherman tool, which wasn't much. And now, I thought maybe the bird call was a signal to someone else. I was extremely nervous and really wanted to run. I was soon back to Squaw Lake, where I decided to step off the trail and go down to the lake to the shoreline, where I could be out in the open, more and away from the underbrush. I went down by the water and stood there, looking back into the trees and wondering if whoever it was would come out where I could see them. I hung out there for a good half hour and saw nothing. I also needed some time to rest, which was another reason for going down there. I now remembered the guy who had walked into the lake again wondered what had happened. I sat on another rock and scanned the lake shore, but I didn't see a soul. It had been a couple of hours since I'd been there before and nothing looked any different. I was finally feeling better and getting ready to leave when that same figure walked out of the lake, almost in the same spot it had gone in. It just emerged like some creature covered with moss in a monster movie. I just sat there and watched, wondering what the heck was going on. Now the figure took off the backpack thing and flung it over its arm and sat down and took something off its feet and appeared to be putting on shoes. It began walking towards me. As it got closer, I could see it was a tall, thin man wearing a wetsuit and carrying oxygen dive tanks, and that made me sigh a sigh of relief. Who would expect someone to be diving out here, especially in these cold waters? I was very happy to have some company on the trail back down, so I waited for him to come closer. Then I greeted him and introduced myself. His name was Bob, and he was very friendly and I asked him if the water was cold. He said it was, but the wetsuit made it tolerable. We talked for a bit, then I asked what was down there that someone would want to dive in cold water to see. He looked at me, kind of like he was checking me out, then said he had a theory he was trying to prove, but he knew I would think he was crazy, so he really didn't want to talk about it. Well, there's no better way to make someone curious than to say something like that. I assured him I wouldn't think he was crazy, but he didn't need to share it unless he felt comfortable. He laughed, then told me that this was Bigfoot country and a friend of his had been fishing and watched a Bigfoot walk straight into the water and not come back out. So now he was here trying to see if there was any chance these creatures lived in underwater caves which would explain why nobody could ever find them. It would be a good hiding place, and since this was a volcanic area, maybe there were lava tubes or such under there that led up above water level so Bigfoot would have oxygen and also a good, safe home. Bob had been a diver in the Navy, so he was comfortable underwater. Well, I did think he was crazy, but I just agreed that it made sense, and I didn't tell him, I thought Bigfoot was an urban legend, or maybe a non-urban legend would make more sense. As we sat there, he told me more about Bigfoot, which, being from the Southwest, wasn't part of my cognitive mindset. Apparently, Squaw Lake had been the site of a number of Bigfoot encounters, especially among fishermen. He hadn't seen one himself, but he did believe in them, and he was sure he'd been followed by them more than once. As he talked, a sense of realization came over me, and I wondered if that wasn't exactly what had been following me. My disbelief was beginning to be challenged. 
I told Bob what had happened up the trail, and he got a look of concern. Maybe we better head out, he said, nervously looking into the forest. I agreed, and we headed out. We were soon back on the main trail, and only had three miles to go until we reached the campground. We'd gone maybe half a mile, neither of us taking our time, when a scream pierced the air and echoed through the thick forest. It was unreal and started out like a cow bellowing, then turned into a shriek like a banshee from hell. How can you adequately describe a sound like that? It's impossible, and the effect it has on one is unlike anything a normal person ever experiences. All I can say is that it was really loud, really echoey, and really terrifying. Whatever made the sound, it sounded mad, and it sounded like it wasn't far behind us. Well, Bob started running, and I was right behind him, his wetsuit making a wish-wash sound. We were both running for our lives. Now, a big branch crashed right next to us, and I wasn't going to turn around to see what had thrown it. Bob must have been in pretty good shape, because, wetsuit or not, he was soon way ahead of me and out of sight. This kind of irritated me, because I didn't think it was cool to leave someone in a situation like we were in. I figured we should stick together. Apparently, Bob thought otherwise. I had run maybe a good half a mile when I started getting a hitch in my side. I wasn't a runner. I was barely a hiker, and a slow hiker at that. I had to stop as I was starting to hurt, and I couldn't breathe. I stepped off the trail and behind a big tree and leaned against it, panting, certain this was the end. It sounds kind of funny when you tell it, but after hearing that scream, believe me, it was terrifying. I read later that Bigfoot is pretty harmless in general. There haven't been many accounts of actual harm, but it's very territorial and will scare you to death. I think that's what was going on. I heard something really, really big crashing through the brush on the other side of the trail from me. And it just went on by. Was it possible it hadn't seen me? I was huffing and puffing so hard it was difficult to even think straight, but I hope so. All was now quiet and I'd regained my composure a bit. What to do? If I just went on down the trail, odds are good I would eventually encounter it again. I could see Four Mile Lake through the trees and I decided to go down to the shoreline and hike back that way as the campground sat right on the lake. In fact, when the lake was high, the campground was flooded. That way, I could stay completely off the trail. I worked my way through the thick brush and trees with every little sound setting off my heart, thinking it was the Bigfoot. But I was finally over by the lake, and I just followed the shoreline back. When I arrived back at the campground, the Volkswagen Rabbit was gone, and several of the picnic tables had been turned over, which would be no easy task. I slunk over to my pickup and slipped inside, locking the doors, then started it up and took off. I just gunned it and bounced down the road as fast as I could get that old pickup going. I have no idea who Bob was, but I assume he made it out okay since his car was gone. I at first thought he was pretty brave, diving down looking for Bigfoot caves, but in retrospect, he wasn't one of the braver fellows I've met. You sure was out for saving himself. If I hadn't flipped off the trail, I have no idea what would have happened. That was enough of Oregon hiking for me, and I spent the rest of my time there reading about Bigfoot on the internet, feeling glad I lived in Phoenix. On to the next one. My name is James, and my wife Cleo and I finally retired after long and stressful careers. We purchased a 34-foot motorhome with the intent of spending a couple of years staying in RV parks in different parts of the country to see where we'd be happiest to settle down. We bought a Jeep Wrangler to tow behind, as our first spot on the list was the Southwest. Our top priority on the wish list is outdoor fun. That's why the four-wheel drive. Because of certain events we are about to disclose, we cannot reveal the exact location at this time. Out of fairness to the property owners, we had leased a rather remote site 
that had about an eighth of an acre per spot and a total of a dozen places for RVs, each with its own water and sewer hookups. Each space was surrounded by desert shrubs and plants to assure almost total privacy from your neighbors. We realized immediately upon receipt of the information packet that this place was perfect for us, having been both in the high-stress business of management for our entire careers, now all we wanted was to have as little contact with others as possible, at least for a year. We needed some unwind time, and that's how the retired physicist and his wife had represented this property that they had recently developed to cater to us new and soon-to-be recluses. We had secured a one-year lease on this spot, quite by chance, as they had opened it only a month prior to our arrival, and it was through Cleo's boss that we heard about it. We settled in quickly. That's the nice thing about the motorhome. We didn't have to unpack. We immediately made the large table on the patio our favorite area, it was surrounded by cacti and various desert plants and flowering bushes. Sitting there with a beautiful view of the desert below us and the red mountains beyond, it looked like a scene from a John Ford Western. We would certainly appreciate that as we planned to spend a lot of time out in that huge area of canyons, butte, and dunes. Being quite a comfortable ways from us, we could barely hear any of the engine noise from our nearest neighbors, and since we were only able to see their place from a certain spot on our patio, we really had all the privacy we could hope for. Our nearest neighbors had just had a visitor, and from where we were sitting, we could barely see it with a fancy sports car. Then, not five minutes later, the neighbors headed out over the narrow but deep arroyo behind us. They had the top down on their old Jeep, and their guest must have been the person bouncing in their back seat. Being as to how this was our goal to soon explore that canyon, we brought out our binoculars to get an idea of where and how best to go. The bridge over that arroyo was accessible to all residents, so we knew the way into those vast canyons behind us. We watched as the people left the concrete bridge and ventured out into the desert. We discussed how maybe we could find out from these neighbors the point of interest, but that could wait until later. We really preferred to not establish any relationships at this point, and as the owners had advised us, to not expect any welcoming visits from the other 11 residents, so we were obviously in good company. Or maybe I should say, not good company. Cleo had turned her lounger at more of an angle so she could watch the jeep, as we had yet to go exploring and we were now getting anxious. As the jeep neared an obvious dry wash, it suddenly veered to the left and almost totally disappeared from our view. All we could see was an occasional waft of dust as it rose out of the jeep's path and was quickly dispersed by constant breezes. We were very interested now because we were both looking forward to our first outing. The signs of the jeep soon disappeared entirely, and we settled back, discussing our plans for our own exploration. When a dust cloud appeared way off to the far right of where we last saw our neighbor's rig, we knew that there was another road indicated on our map that entered at the far end of the canyon to our extreme right, but this dust was coming from almost beneath the high cliff in the center. It took about another 20 minutes of watching the growing dust cloud until we could finally make out the type of vehicle and it was the same Jeep. The difference was that now there were only two people. Their passenger wasn't there. Funny how we both kind of squished down in our chairs so as to not let them know we were watching, but the thoughts were racing through our minds. Did they drop their guest off at a campsite? Were they maybe going to return and camp overnight? Just as we were discussing our other nosy thought, the couple came back outside their motorhome and the lady got into their visitor's car and began leaving with her husband in the jeep following her out. They were out of sight behind our thick trees and the sounds of their engines died out. They were gone. 
We knew it had to be the lady and her husband, and now our curiosity was really piqued. We then hustled around outside the patio and slightly rearranged the lattice work standing on the cement blocks marking the edge of the patio so that we each had a good line of sight but also repositioning our table and chairs slightly to take better advantage of the hedge behind us. We knew now that we were totally hidden from their view, but yet we could spy on them. We laughed at how we were over-dramatizing what was something that was none of our business, but Cleo said she simply liked to people watch, but in private. I still thought we were just being nosy. That is, until two hours later, when we were in the coach and heard the distinct sound of a vehicle approaching. We both sprinted to the patio and slid into our chairs when the couple returned. They were both in the Jeep. Now, we pondered aloud what possible reason could this all have been about. There could be any number of explanations that didn't even rate discussing, so we dropped any further thought of the incident. That is, until a few days later, when we were enjoying our patio, which was now our favorite place for relaxation. A camouflage-printed 4x4 pickup pulled into the site down below, and the couple both came out of their RV and shook hands all around. Then the visitor handed the man what appeared to be an attaché case. Yes, through my 12 power binoculars, it was an attaché case. Now, I wasn't spying. I simply kept the glasses there on the table for bird watching. Very soon, the same scenario played out as before. They disappeared into the canyon once more, all three in the jeep, and by the same route as the last time, we once again watched the dust ball swirl out of the dry creek bed, only to be dispersed by the constant wind. Soon, the dust was heading for the same distant cliff area as before. After another hour and a half, here came the jeep. No, we thought there may have been a third person, but it was just a tan tarpaulin covered with dust. Only the husband and wife returned. The performance was again the same as before. In a very few minutes, he drove their guest's big camo truck and she followed in the jeep. Two or so hours later, they returned in the jeep and everything returned to their usual quiet routine. In fact, when we thought about it, we had yet to see them do anything in their yard or outside except take drive. At least we spent time on our patio drinking wine and spying on them. That settled it. Our curiosity had gotten stir crazy until a few days later, another car pulled into their yard. But we almost missed it because it was almost totally concealed by their blossoming hedge. Just as before, the same scenario repeated and the giant-looking dude almost couldn't have fit in their jeep if the top had not been off. There they were, with the wife in the back seat, and they took their usual route down into the wash, and soon they were only a distant dust cloud. We now put our noiseless plan into action as we grabbed our prepared backpacks complete with bottled water, snacks, binoculars, and guns. Out we went, jumped into our jeep, and turned off just before our driveway hit the entrance road and followed the short curve to the left and down to the other road that was about 300 yards away from the desert entrance used by our neighbors. We had been out this way a couple of times before, but had never gone more than a few hundred feet just to see how easy the going would be in this world of sand. The neighbor's rig was already throwing up a small cloud of dust, but as usual, they kept their speed and their dusty presence fairly low. We did the same, only I drove out into the desert further until I got on a fairly distinct route that perhaps had been a rather well-used trail before the property had been developed into our leases, thus changing the route and making it nearly impossible for non-residents to even find a route into the desert from our remote locale. We were now heading in roughly the same direction as the other jeep, but knowing that the others would never see us through the large dust cloud they were kicking behind them, I increased my speed quite a bit, 
until I felt we were slightly gaining on them in case they made another sudden turn, so I edged up a little further. This road hadn't been used for a while. We kept bucking the drift that kept us at a slant most of the way. All we could see of the other jeep was dust as it remained down in the wash the entire way. Soon, their dust cloud became smaller in size, which indicated they were slowing. So I hung back a bit and slowed down as well. Suddenly, their jeep appeared briefly as it fairly leaped out of the dry wash and up onto the sand, and almost instantly, it disappeared around a large clump of prickly pear, and then the dust cleared. I cut the engine immediately, and as we carefully opened our doors, there was no sound of the other engine, and I only hoped I had been in time and that they hadn't heard us, although we were still quite a long ways back. The constant howling of the canyon winds helped mask all sound. We carefully pushed our doors closed, and carrying our packs, we stealthily went forward at just short of a crawl. We were traveling in a small depression of another dry wash. As we peered around a very large and very old saguaro, we saw the three people about 200 feet ahead of us. They were almost to the short rock outcropping of smooth sandstone that dominated the spectacular scenery in this country. The party disappeared from sight around a sandy mound and we took the opportunity to run as fast as we could, our backpacks flapping and making us wish we had taken time to adjust them properly. We stayed off to the side of their tracks a good 60 or so feet so they wouldn't see our tracks whenever they were turned. It was then that we heard what sounded like a muffled gunshot. It seemed to echo throughout the canyon for only a few seconds, as if it were far away. Did they drive all the way out here for target shooting? No more shots sounded, so we both thought they may have seen a rattlesnake, which were plentiful. When we cautiously peered around the sand mound where we were, there was a couple coming out of what appeared to be an ever so small crack in the high red cliff. Their passenger, however, was no longer with them. They couldn't have passed more than a hundred feet from where we crouched on hands and knees as they went back to their jeep. We could almost hear our heart beat as we held our breath. I was perspiring profusely as I could envision them seeing our jeep, which would have been visible had they climbed even the shortest dune, but then the reassuring sound of their engine roared, and as I slowly peered alongside a purple sage, I saw the welcome sight of their rapidly departing dust cloud. We quickly began searching for their tracks from the cliff, and Cleo called out as she followed their footprints to the cliff face. I quickly caught up, and we carefully and rather nervously approached the narrow crack in the cliff. The jagged entrance was about three feet across, and there was an old branch of some sort of gnarly tree standing just inside. It was then that we noticed that the footprint had been obliterated to about four feet out from the wall of the cliff. Obviously, these people had erased the sign that they had entered the crack, leaving the rest of their trail to the wind. What appeared to be a dead end would certainly have discouraged us from proceeding further had it not been for what had very obviously occurred. A man had disappeared. All of our thoughts of them maybe shuttling friends to a big campout were lost now in suspicion. Where have all their guests been going? On hands and knees, we crept forward, and using the flashlight from our backpack, we scrutinized the area around the sandstone rock below the bottom of the cut, and were able to easily slide it aside. It was lighter than I had assumed. The sand that blocked the hole beyond had apparently been pushed up as the people departed, and had we not known better, we would never have thought of entering what could well be a cavern full of snakes. That is what we newcomers to the desert all envisioned from the tales of Indiana Jones. Slithering on our bellies, we were soon on our feet once again, and in a small room about the size of a couple of beach cabanas. To all appearances, there was nothing to see, and the seven or so feet high ceiling made it very claustrophobic. I made one quick sweep of the perimeter 
and was about to call it quits when I noticed a rather ominous dark crack behind a vertical column in the very far corner of this cave. And as I approached, the sand suddenly began sliding out from under my feet. I reacted quickly and jumped back. I called Cleo over, and using our lights together, we saw that there was a dark, jagged hole alongside the rock column into which the loose sand was steadily draining due to my movement. I looked around and found a football-sized piece of red rock, which I carefully tossed into the hole, and as we listened, we could hear a thump, thump, thump as the rock eventually headed somewhere deep beneath us. We both let out an audible gasp as our eyes met, and we both experienced a horrible fear of what we had discovered. Using the sticks by the entrance, we now found ourselves erasing signs of our own presence and fled the scene like the devil himself was behind us. When we got back to our jeep, I took an even more indirect route when I found another trail that cut off to our left, and in the 4x4 low, I kept on that course that took us further away from the road we had come in on. And when we were a good three miles from where we had followed the other jeep, through the wash, I turned right and again headed back to our same cutoff to home in high range once more. So it would appear to watchful eyes we were just exploring the desert. The first thing upon arriving home, we sneaked a peek at our neighbor's house and found both vehicles were gone. We quickly washed our jeep, and it dried fast in the bright sunlight. So later on, when our neighbors returned home, we were once again having a glass of wine on the patio. We didn't know if they ever looked, but we had to assume that common sense would dictate it. Now was the hardest part. Without revealing suspicion, how to go about seeking help from the authorities, we waited until the next day, and I headed into the city and to the nearest state police agency. I won't say where, because they started out being extremely rude. Anyway, there were no apparent missing persons report, and after two intense hours, we were about to leave when an officer burst into the room and asked us to once again describe the vehicles that we had been seeing. Now we had attention, scads of it. Enough so that the authorities immediately placed us under protective custody and the place began to buzz. You'd have thought we had discovered a live bomb from all the activity. Two large helicopters landed in the parking lot and out poured no less than 10 people in both uniforms and suits. We were asked again about the vehicles we had seen, and then the officers produced photographs somewhere in the 20s of various cars and trucks, one that looked a lot like our neighbor's jeep. We identified the ones we had seen, and they still didn't say much. But we were flown to Phoenix, still under protective custody, and sequestered in a splendid hotel with all the amenities carte blanche. Had everything not been because such a frightening reason, it might have been more fun being spoiled. We were soon sworn to silence under what they told us was a gag order. Evidently, we must have stumbled onto something big. Only after arrests were made that included our neighbors and 13 other people did we finally learn what was behind all of this. By then, we had been allowed to return home. A substantial reward was given to us, and due to the possibility of further repercussions, we had to move twice and now live under different names. And finally, they also gave us permission to send the story, which we had to have these people review first. The entire plot involved a very sinister group of criminals who perpetrated crimes under the guise of the Yi Naliadoshi, the Navajo Skinwalker. All of these main members of this conspiracy were posing as members of the Navajo, but it has now been proven that although they were deemed to be Native American, except for a few like our neighbors, none of the offenders were Navajo at all. The entire plot centered on offering the rituals and training to allow these imposters to become the witches known as skinwalkers. These people knew that for a Navajo to become a skinwalker, the base requirement was the candidate must first kill a blood relative. These bloody gangsters, as the chief investigator told us, 
were charging enormous amounts of money with the promise of performing ceremonies to allow these men to join the Navajo tribe and become skinwalkers. This would allow them to become invisible and they were enticed with untold riches amounting to millions of dollars. The investigators said that this conspiracy was fairly easy to pull off because the Navajos are the envy of other tribes and even though the skinwalker is so terrifying that even the Navajo avoid mentioning it, these people paid huge amounts of money thinking they could become fabulously wealthy with the new powers of shape-shifting and invisibility. Our neighbors down below us were brought in to be the final solution when the suckers had been built out of all they could squeeze them for, and they began getting mad and threatening to expose the scam. These people were then told that their procedures were now ready to go, and the trip to the desert was to visit a secret cavern wherein they would receive their indoctrination by the most sacred skinwalker. The hole we discovered must have been very deep, as the couple admitted to bludgeoning most of the candidates, but in a few instances where they said the men became belligerent, they just pushed them into the hole alive. We don't expect to hear any more from the authorities because we've done all we can and our monetary rewards were more than generous. They put a sort of a limited gag order on us with penalties enough that we had to get a special final release to submit this to you. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!